It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am Jonathan Cao, and today I will be giving an introduction into how recurrent neural networks can be used for neuroscience. So I want to just start off with the neural networks side of things and uh, the deep learning revolution, which I'm sure all of you uh, have heard about and are maybe even familiar with about how deep neural networks have really uh, led to significant advances in technology, starting 10 years ago with computer vision, where um, a convolutional neural network was entered into the ImageNet competition, where the goal is to classify images into certain categories. And the first CNN, AlexNet, um, decreased the error rate from 25% to 16%, a huge jump in improvement in accuracy. And that led to a lot of people working on computer vision, uh, neural networks for computer vision. And here I've taken a, a web, uh, an image from the ImageNet website, where here you can see for an image, convolutional neural networks are able to discern the objects in the image and even localize them. Deep learning has also been really useful for natural language processing. And so here's an example from OpenAI, where using a language model, you can type into a text prompt an image that you would like to generate. In this case, it's an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And the output of the neural network looks like this. And you can see that looks pretty good in terms of if you ask a human designer to design an armchair in the shape of an avocado, it might turn out to look something like that. By the way, please feel free to stop me for questions along the way. Um, recently, uh, deep learning has been applied to many other fields. And so I've shown origami folded here to uh, represent AlphaFold, which is a deep learning architecture by DeepMind that makes significant progress in the problem of turning a string of amino acids into a protein structure. Right. And the last example that I wanted to give is one that particularly inspired me six years ago, which is uh, also an AI from DeepMind called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo was trained to play the game of Go. And in this picture here, uh, it's a screenshot from a video uh, of a match, a five game match between AlphaGo, the AI, and one of the best Go players in the world, Lee Sedol. And in this matchup of five, AlphaGo was able to win four games to one against someone who is widely regarded as the best Go player in the world. So this example was particularly compelling for me because I recall during my undergraduate, my machine learning professors thought that Go wouldn't be solved anytime in the near future. The reason that is is because Go is an exceedingly complex game. In terms of the number of board states, there are more board states in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And when you ask a Go player, a really good Go player, why they made a certain move, oftentimes they'll reply with something intuition-based, like it just felt right. And so there's no way that you could train an AI to do a tree search to evaluate the next future moves and then play the best one because Go is too complex for that. And so if you want to build an AI that's good at Go, that AI has to learn the same types of intuitions that grandmasters use. It has to be able to look at a board and know if it's in a good position or not. And the idea of training an AI to have that kind of intuition is challenging. Nevertheless, DeepMind was able to do this. And um, because AlphaGo was able to beat Lisa Dole, it clearly shows that AlphaGo is able to evaluate board positions and know if they're good or bad, much like humans do. All right? And AlphaGo itself is a neural network, of course. And um, as this was playing out, many people had the question, what is AlphaGo thinking? Right? It would be really interesting if we could open up AlphaGo and um, know the strategies that it's employing to play the game of Go well. But at another level, if AlphaGo's behavior is similar to humans, which it is here, or actually it's superhuman here, what if AlphaGo's artificial neurons also look like the brain's uh, biological neurons? If it achieves the same behavior using artificial neurons that look like biological neurons, might there be a deeper connection? 
might the AI and the humans do similar computations to perform these tasks? Right. So um, we'll unpack this a bit further later on for much simpler tasks. Um, but one reason this might be good is because neural networks are systems that we know exactly how they work in terms of their implementation. So they're described by fully known equations. So at the very fundamental level, an artificial neuron is uh, like here, a unit drawn that takes inputs, in this case, x1 to x4, and it multiplies them by weight w1 to w4. It then sums them together and applies some nonlinearity, f, and that f can be a function like the hyperbolic tangent or the rectified linear unit, ray root. What an artificial neural network then is just is then is just a composition of many of these artificial neurons. So now we have many connections and many neurons. And in an artificial neural network, its entire input to output relationship is precisely described by the weights of these networks and the inputs. And so for a given input, you can know the exact output that a neural network will produce. We even get to learn, or in the implementation of these, we even know the exact learning rule that sets the connection weights between the artificial neurons for these networks. All right. Any questions so far? All right. So um, in opening up neural networks or in looking at neural networks, um, one thing that's interesting is that even though we know the precise equations that implement a neural network, their computation is often treated as a black box. And this is because knowing the precise equations for a neural network doesn't really uh, give insight directly into what computation at a high level it's doing. So an example is in a computer circuit, I could tell you how exactly every transistor is connected to each other. And with that circuit, you could compute the output for a given input. But unless you designed the circuit or um, had more information about the circuit, it might be hard to deduce that this transistor circuit where you can calculate the output for any input is implementing, for example, an amplifier or a microprocessor or some other type of circuit. And so um, neural networks are often treated as black boxes. And because uh, we are close to Caltech, I thought it great to bring up this Feynman quote um, attributed to Feynman and to others where if you cannot explain something in simple terms, then you don't understand it. And so if all I can do is explain a neural network's computations in terms of it's this particular weight matrix times this input passed through this nonlinearity, but I can't tell you at a more intuitive high level the exact computation the neural network is doing, then we don't really understand it. All right. So um, now returning back to the brain, in the past decade, we have seen advancing neural technologies that enable us to record from hundreds to even thousands of neurons across multiple brain areas. And so there was this Nature 2019, 2019 paper by Nick Steinmetz and colleagues where they recorded something like 30,000 neurons across 42 brain areas. And we are getting increasingly more and more uh, massive data sets. And um, there is this thought that as we record more and more data, that'll lend insights into the computations that the brain is performing. But we know uh, that there's another bottleneck, which is the computational bottleneck. How do you make sense of the um, increasing amounts of data that we are recording? And so how do we understand the computation performed by neurons in particular brain areas from this data? Well, there are some challenges and limitations to the data that we record. And this includes that first, when we record from the brain, we have sparse sampling, meaning that we record at most hundreds to thousands of neurons from particular brain areas. If you look at the motor cortex, where they're on, there are on the order of 100 million neurons, and we're recording uh, 100 neurons, for example, like from the Utah array, uh, 
then we are recording just 0.0001% of the neurons in the motor cortex. Now, of course, there are, uh, there's work, for example, by Surya Ganguly that shows that for uh, simple tasks, this is sufficient and we can still gain good insight from it. But it still remains, uh, we have sparse sampling of neurons when we, when we record from these brain areas. Second, uh, we oftentimes lack connectivity information. So unless someone has also done an axonal tracing experiment, we won't know which neurons are directly connected to each other, um, let alone the synaptic weights. And so we know that the synapses also in the brain are dynamic and complex. We don't observe the inputs to a cortical area that we're recording from. So we could be recording from the motor cortex, and the motor cortex receives inputs from several areas. One of them is the prefrontal cortex. And so the prefrontal cortex itself is doing some computations that then produce an output that is given to motor cortex. But if we're only recording from motor cortex, then we won't know what the format or the structure of those inputs into motor cortex are. And then uh, lastly here, we also have limited understanding of the learning role. So we, of course, understand uh, some principles of synaptic plasticity, but the learning role isn't precisely known, at least at the level of detail that we know it in machine learning, where we set the learning role. We choose the learning role. Question here. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, instead of motor cortex, what if we took a more simple organism like C. elegans, where we know all of this information uh, except the learning role? And uh, that is a really interesting point that I'm actually going to raise that point exactly with neural networks, but then those systems may be more amenable. Uh, we still are lacking some of the techniques to gain insight into these fully observed systems, which we'll also see with neural networks. Any other questions? Yes, so the question is, uh, we know some information about synaptic update rules, like we know heavy in principles, neurons that fire together, wire together. So why am I saying it's not precisely known? In uh, machine learning, we know how to calculate, for example, the magnitude of the changes precisely. We know exactly how much each weight will change at a given step, and we know that how it's derived from uh, something that we call a loss function that tells us how good the model is doing. So while we know principles in biology and machine learning, we have much more precise information about the credit assignment problem. Great question. All right, any other questions? I just realized I'm still wearing my mask and I'm going to take it off uh, since, um, since it's hard to breathe. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. All right, another question? Yeah, uh, when you say accuracy, what accuracy are you referring to? Um, more like when we are using uh, the neural diversity model something, yeah. like a local working model that we need, yeah. um, and we are using that to predict the accuracy here, it helps understand how much the neural response can be predicted in the machine. Yeah, great. So the question is, uh, there is additional stochasticity and um, uh, if you were measuring from the brain, uh, and let's say you had a good number of neurons, would the accuracy ever get to 100%? Uh, maybe for simple tasks it could, but definitely it wouldn't be uh, 
there would still be the limitation that it's hard to model uh, all the stochasticity in a process. Usually we just uh, accept it and we then model our systems to also be producing stochastic outputs. Like I'm sure, I think Chetan talked about alpha edge and there the outputs are modeled to be Poisson uh, spikes. As well, it also relates to unobserved inputs because when you record from a brain area, there may be other cognitive processes going on. So maybe there are some inputs that we don't observe from other brain areas also affecting that circuit. So given all of these limitations, um, actually before that, uh, I wanna put up this slide that says, even though we have these limitations, of course it's far from hopeless. Uh, the entire neuroscience literature speaks to this. And I wanna of course highlight excellent progress in terms of understanding computation from a systems neuroscience pr perspective using dimensionality reduction and dynamical systems that I think your uh, earlier speakers have, have talked about more. And I put this up because I wanna emphasize that uh, the things that I talk about today with RNN modeling are complementary to the dynamical systems approach and dimensionality reduction. My group uses all of these techniques also. And so we should really think of these as complementary ways in, uh, to gain insight into neural computation. All right, so given these challenges and limitations, a thought comes up, which is, can we make progress by studying a quote unquote simpler system? Now, I put simpler in quotes because being simpler than the brain can still be quite complex. And given that I talked about neural networks before, I think you guys probably all see where this is going. So in contrast to cerebral cortex or to the brain, um, for an artificial neural network, these challenges are all addressed. So while we have sparse sampling in the cerebral cortex, the artificial neural network is fully observed. And so I will know the activations of every single neuron. In fact, oftentimes artificial neural networks aren't even built with stochasticity. So I can determine exactly what the activation of every single neuron is, and I observe every single neuron in the network. Whereas in the cerebral cortex, or rather than in neurophysiology experiments, we oftentimes don't have connectivity information. In an artificial neural network, I know the weights of every single one of these connections between artificial neurons. Uh, furthermore, in an artificial neural network, the connections between neurons are far simpler than synapses because in artificial neural networks, each one of these lines is just a scalar weight. They don't have their own dynamics. And so not only are the connections simpler, and uh, I observe every single one of them. In an artificial neural network, all the inputs are observed. And so we know exactly what goes into the network. And we can therefore calculate, for example, how the input changes the activations of all of these artificial neurons. And uh, lastly, whereas in the cortex, we have limited learning rule knowledge, in the artificial neural network, we know the exact learning rule. And so when it comes to using neural networks to model the cortex, the basic idea is the following. What if we train an artificial neural network, and I'll get into more detail about this, to do the same behaviors using similar artificial activity to the neurophysiological activity, and then try to open up the neural network where we fully observe everything to propose mechanisms and hypotheses for the computations being performed. Any questions here? All right, so uh, a concern that you might have is aren't neural networks, even though they're fully observed, too complex to understand? And a reply that I would have for that is, yes, neural networks are very difficult and challenging to understand because they have nonlinearities. And a lot of theory goes out the window when we have nonlinearities. At the same time, I hope I've convinced you that studying the neural network is still simpler, much simpler than the brain. And so, if we can't understand a simpler artificial neural network, won't it be much harder, much more difficult to understand the um, brain's computation? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Um, well, so not necessarily. So the question is, um, if we are using an artificial neural network to model a cortical computation, does it assume that the brain is also nonlinear? Uh, so if a computation in the brain is approximately linear, we'll talk about recurrent neural networks as approximators of dynamical systems. And they can approximate both linear and nonlinear neural dynamics. Yeah, no, no, I got it. Oh, sorry. What I was asking you, OK, uh, feel free to ask again. I, I'm sorry, I misinterpreted the question. Yeah. All right, and then as I'll show through example today, there's already been a fairly good progress along these lines. Um, another aspect of this, I think, is that if we develop tools to understand artificial neural network computation, they may also be generalizable to looking at neural data sets in the future. All right, so, so far I've talked about neural networks generally. The next question might be why recurrent neural networks, uh, since this talk is about recurrent neural networks, particularly for neuroscience. And the first thing I wanna say is recurrent neural networks are not necessary. So there's been good work modeling, for example, the visual stream using feed-forward convolutional neural networks. Uh, the key take-home is that in comparison to feed-forward neural networks, feed-forward here just means that there are no loops, so the connections in one layer only go forward to the next layer, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, these feed-forward neural networks, because they don't have loops, do not have dynamics. And I think dynamics has probably been uh, a significant theme of the summer school, so a quick example for this is if your task is a natural language processing task where your input is the current letter of a word and your goal is to predict the next character in that word. So your input is only the, the current letter. So maybe the, you've had the letters T and then H typed. And so your current input is the letter H. In this task, if your goal is to predict the next character, you would hope that the architecture is going to output a vowel, like E or A or O, something that follows TH. On the other hand, if you have typed T-H-O-U-G-H, the input to the feedforward neural network at this time step is the current letter, which is just H. You would want the network to output something like a T or maybe a space character, uh, indicating to move on to the next word. But for a feedforward feed neural network, uh, the same input, the letter H, is always going to produce the same output distribution over targets. And so because it has no notion of dynamics or history to know what was typed before H, then the neural network that is speed forward is gonna output the same character in both of these situations. Right now, of course, you could adapt these networks to take in a history of inputs, and that gets you uh, closer to transformers. But that's the idea for how, um, or for one reason, we may not favor a feed-forward neural network because it has no dynamics. Any questions there? All right, so in contrast, uh, we have in a recurrent neural network, feedback connections. And this feedback leads to dynamics. And so here's our recurrent neural network. We have some input U of T that is mapped through W in, and then it affects all of these hidden units. And now you can see here that a unit like this one connects to this one, connects to this one, and follows this loop all the way back to its own self. And so what this means is that the activations of these hidden units aren't now just affected by the inputs, but also by the neighbors it's connected to, and even potentially itself. This network will, sorry, this artificial neuron here, will impact its own activity after several time steps when the activity has followed this loop through the other artificial neurons in the network. So now what I could do is I could apply an input to the network, then turn the input off. And if I turn the input off, now the activity in this network is going to percolate and it's not just going to die back down to zero, but now it may do interesting things 
For example, it may converge to a different steady state activity for all of these units. We'll see that that corresponds to converging to an attractor state. But also, it could enter a state called a limit cycle where all of these activities, they just oscillate in perpetuity. And so, because now the activity of these neurons is persistent across time, it can model past inputs. And oftentimes, the cortical areas that we want to study, like motor cortex or prefrontal cortex, are known to have strong dynamics. And so we would also want to, in general, choose a neural network that also has dynamics. And that's a recurrent neural network. Any questions here? All right. So um, this is the equation of a recurrent neural network. Again, we'll detail it more in the methods lecture. And uh, x of t, you can think of as the activity of all of these artificial neurons. And when we write down the equation of an artificial neural network, we see that um, x of t relates to the derivative of x of t. And this di defines a dynamical system. So if you just think of x of t as positions, then x dot t is velocities. and that means that this equation tells us that if you're in some part of state space, if x of t is equal to this location, x dot of t corresponds to your velocity at that location. It's going to, let me pick this location actually. x dot t corresponds to a velocity vector that tells you how your state is going to change when you're in that location. And so this essentially will define a dynamical flow field, and that flow field governs how these trajectories evolve through time. If you're like me and uh, this x dot of t as it relates to x of t isn't the most intuitive way to think of that dynamical system, you can also make a, a first order Euler approximation on this x dot of t term. And we'll do that in the methods lecture to define a recurrence relationship relating x of t to x of t plus one. And here you can plainly see that the activity of the artificial neural network at x t exactly dictates what the activity of the neural network will be at xt plus one, and that models dynamics. Any questions here? All right. So uh, a recurrent neural network can also approximate any dynamical system. So it has a universal dynamical system approximation theory. And so it can implement at something as, similar, as simple as linear dynamics all the way up to uh, nonlinear dynamics with very um, complex flow fields. All right, so this is the basic way RNNs have then been used for neuroscience. What we do is we define one or multiple tasks. These could be the tasks, or these usually are the tasks that animals will be trained to perform. For the task, we define the task inputs. Those are the things that the animal is presented. So for example, if the animal is doing a reaching task, you show the animal where to reach, that would be a task input. And then you define the task outputs. And so in a reaching task, after the animal knows the target, it'll execute a, a movement to that target. And that velocity and position of that movement could, for example, be the outputs z of t of the neural network. After that, we train the recurrent neural network to learn the task. And uh, again, we'll get into more detail about this in the methods lecture. And, and Brandon has prepared a, a notebook that will go over training an RNN to learn a particular task, a decision-making task. After that, we look at the RNN behavior as well as its artificial neural activity, and we assess the extent to which it resembles, respectively, the animal's empirical behavior as well as the neural activity recorded from the animal. Okay? So if it doesn't, then we go back to two and we might modify the learning so that the behavior and the artificial activity of the recurrent neural network match or more closely match the activity that we record during the experiment. If we have matched them, then what we have is essentially an in silico uh, circuit, the recurrent neural network, that reproduces the behavior as well with artificial activity that resembles the uh, animal's activity and leveraging its full observability that we see all of its artificial neurons, that we know all of the weights, we can probe this recurrent neural network to propose new hypotheses or even predictions for future experiments. 
about the computation that is happening, all right? Um, I say propose because, again, I'm not saying that the recurrent neural network will exactly implement what is done in the brain, but at least it proposes a mechanism with testable predictions that, uh, that is a hypothesis for the computation going on. Okay. It sort of seems like step three might be might allow you to sort of overfit. Mm -hmm. But if you're if but if you kind of you said like you have some held out stuff that you use to sort of validate like make make predictions that you can test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll just re re restate what Chris was saying, which is um uh it's really important that we also develop predictions for future experiments to test the hypotheses that the neural network develops. Uh, otherwise, like Chris was saying, it could be just overfit to the data. Any other questions? All right. So um, to show how this might go about, I've decided to present two examples and go through um, those studies. Uh, but there's a huge literature here applied to many different areas, and I'll have a summary slide at the end of some of these other areas. Uh, today, we're going to focus on one of the seminal studies here by Monte and Cicillo. And then after that, I'll show another example from my own group's work. So this is a, a Nature 2013 paper by Valerio Monte and David Cicillo and colleagues. And uh, when we get to the hands-on session, Brandon and I have prepared a collab notebook where you're going to start from scratch and implement a recurrent neural network that is trained the same way that it was done in Monte Cicillo. And you're going to reproduce the results of that paper, including the behavior, as well as uh, several of the analyses. And so I wanted to acknowledge Brandon, who put a lot of hard work into this and wrote all of the code. All right. And so um, in this study, there is something called a contextual de uh, dependent uh, um, random dots motion task or integration task. And there is both a motion and a color component of this. Let's ignore the color for now and just talk about the motion. So what happens is that the monkey performing this task is going to fixate on a um, point to start the trial. After that, two targets are going to appear left and right. Again, ignore the color for now. And then what's going to happen is a bunch of dots are going to appear on the screen. And the dots are going to coherent, move with some coherence to the right or the left. And so I have an example of what this looks like. Um, this is not actually an easy task, so I'm actually repeating the same trial over and over again. And you can see um, for my student who I asked to produce this video, he looked at these dots and thought, OK, they're probably moving coherently to the left. The monkeys are really good at this task. Actually, they perform usually better than, than humans here. So the dots will move in some direction. And based off of the direction, left or right, the monkey is going to make a decision to reach to the left or the right target. All right. So that's the motion part of the task. There's also the color part of the task. So in the color part of the task, the left and right targets are assigned a color, in this case, green or red. And each of the individual dots will now also have a color. And if you're in the color context where you're making a decision based off of color and not motion, then you need to make uh, in this case, a, a saccade or a reach to the target that matches the dominant color. So in this trial here, you can see the motion is to the right, which would mean selecting the red target, but the colors are dominant green. So you would want to select the green target if you were in the color context. So this fixation cue can be a blue cross or a yellow square. If it's a blue cross, you got to pay attention to color. So in this case, you would reach to the left uh, or saccade to the left to select the green target. And if it was a yellow square, then you would choose the right target because you're paying attention to the motion. All right. Any questions on the task? It's pretty important. All right. So this is an example of what the stimuli look like. So there's going to be a color coherence that refers to the dominant color in the dots. And so uh, when the color coherence is closer to green, most of the dots are green and vice versa for red. And then there's also a motion coherence. And so the size of these arrows is uh, a figure proxy for the general strength of motion of the dots for the task. And so uh, here is going to be strong motion to the left. And here is going to be strong motion to the right. And so um, 
in this study, they trained multiple monkeys to perform this task, and the monkeys were able to train successfully. And so here we're showing psychometric curves. If we just pay attention to this plot right here, on the x-axis is motion coherence, the left side being strong motion to the left, the right side being strong motion to the right, and the y-axis is the percentage of time the monkey chooses the right. So when there's strong coherence to the right, the monkey chooses the right most of the time, and when it's to the left, it chooses the right almost none of the time. And you can see in between, uh, it has uh, what you might expect of performance. If you focus on the bottom right panel here, now color coherence is on the x-axis and the y-axis is twice as to green, and you can see the behavior is as expected. When the color coherence is green, the monkey will make a reach to the green target. On the other hand, when you're in the motion context, which is panel C and D. Can you try to zoom in on what you've got here? Just in case you guys can't see all. Oh, okay. So if it wants to work for the best, it doesn't. All right. Can you guys see it fine? Do you see everything going from the front of the show? Great. The question is, were both contexts presented at the same time? Yes. So on every single trial, there was both, uh, there were both moving dots, and the dots always had a color. So, oh yeah, sorry. Perfect. Yeah. The question is, how does the monkey know which context to focus to? So when the monkey fixates on this fixation point, it's either going to be a blue cross or a yellow square. And then based off of the identity of that, they pay attention to color or motion. Great. So motion context is this C and D panels. And you can see that across red to green colors, the monkey uh, rarely chooses to move to the green. right? And that shows like, there's a small effect, but it shows that the monkey is largely ignoring the color context. Any questions? Any other questions on the task? All right. So um, Monte and Cecilia then did dimensionality reduction to try to gain insight into the computation that was being performed by the, popu uh, by the population. And so here they chose three axes, which are low dimensional projections of the high D neural activity. And there is a choice axis. This is the decision the monkey makes to which target. There's a motion axis. The motion axis is related to the strength of coherence of the movement of the dots. And then there's a color axis, which relates to the strength of coherence for the um, color of the dots. And so you can see when, we, when they plot the choice in the motion axis, and um, these, uh, three trajectories here correspond to strong to weak uh, motion to choice one. The trajectories go towards choice one. And then along the y-axis, which is the motion axis, there is separation between strong, medium, and weak coherence. All right? And the same for choice two. But then if you were to rotate and plot now choice and color axis along the y-axis, you can see that the motion trajectories for strong, medium, and weak are largely overlapping. So there's a little motion variance in uh, motion separation in the color axis. Now, the surprising thing about these trajectories, or the not maybe not surprising, but the interesting thing is that when you're in the motion context, remember the dots still all have a color. And if you were to sort these trajectories by color, what you see is that the trajectories still are representing color information about the color of the dots. All right, so there's separation in color coherence uh, from the dark blue to the hollow dark blue um, uh, trajectories. All right. And so the same thing holds for the color context. And uh, if you were to then look at uh, this PFC data and compare it to prevailing hypotheses, what they found is that prevailing hypotheses don't account for this. So let me just give one example of a hypothesis that they tested or that they wanted to compare to. This is called the context-dependent early selection hypothesis. 
In this hypothesis, there's just a choice axis, right? PFC definitely has to represent choice because you have to know what target the monkey is going to reach to. But then the context-dependent early selection hypothesis says that when you get that fixation cue, the blue plus or the yellow square, the brain then, the circuit then knows which context to pay attention to. And then it transforms, if you're in the motion context, motion evidence into movement along the choice axis. Whereas if you're in the color context, then it transforms the green or redness of those dots into motion across the choice axis. If you were in this hypothesis, you would not see color separation in the motion context, and you wouldn't see motion separation in the color context. And so that's one hypothesis that they were able to rule out. This data was actually so complex that, or not so, it was complex enough that um, what they did to model how the brain does this selective integration where it pays attention to color or motion and then makes the correct choice is they ended up training a recurrent neural network to do this task. And so this RNN is going to receive two input streams corresponding to the motion and the color coherence. And so there, uh, these streams are going to be noisy since the stimulus is also noisy, uh, but their mean activity is going to be the coherence of the motion and the coherence of the color. And then the recurrent neural network is going to receive two more inputs and the two inputs tell you whether you're in the motion context or the color context. And so then based off of both the contextual input as well as the input streams reflecting the coherence of that uh, input source, then the neural network is going to make uh, an output that either goes up corresponding to choice one or goes down corresponding to choice two. All right, any questions here? All right, so um, before I go further, I wanna do another brief aside, which is uh, ways in which we probe recurrent neural network dynamics to generate hypotheses for these computations. So this is the equation of the recurrent neural network. And we know that x dot of t, when we think of the flow field, uh, x dot of t tells me the directions in which those arrows point in the flow field. And so when x dot of t is equal to zero, that corresponds to what is called a fixed point in the flow field, where if your neural state is at that exact point and there is no input or perturbation, it will stay at that point, especially if the point is uh, a stable attractor. So the dot corresponds to what the fixed point location is in state space, and then there will be arrows around it. So again, at the fixed point, there are no arrows. The velocity is zero because x dot is equal to zero. And so these points of x dot equals zero could be stable attractors like shown on the left. They could be repellers. So those are unstable fixed points where even if you're at this location, any small perturbation is going to kick you away from this location because all the dynamics take you out. And then what is most common uh, oftentimes in high dimensional systems are called saddle points. In saddle points, some dimensions are stable and some dimensions are unstable, where if you go in that dimension, you're gonna be kicked out. So these highlighted dimensions are the unstable dimensions of the dynamics here. So if you solve for x dot of t equals zero, you can identify these fixed points. And then uh, one example that I think is a really nice demonstration of this, also from David Cicillo, is this task where you can train a recurrent neural network to be a three-bit flip-flop, to remember three uh, to remember three states, three, sorry, to remember three different input lines. And so in this task, the black corresponds to the inputs, and then the red, green, and blue correspond to three outputs of the network. So there are three input lines and three output lines. And the goal of the recurrent neural network is for every single input line, its output line has to remember what the last pulse direction was. So here, the black pulse is up. So the output in red is gonna be holding the one state. And then when the input pulses down, then it remembers the minus one state. And then when it pulses back up, it remembers the up state again. And if, it, uh, if you look at the second input and output line, if it pulses down, it's at negative one, and there's another pulse down, it's just going to remember negative one, all right? So this recurrent neural network essentially has to remember three states, each of which can be plus one or minus one, 
And so if you just look at the colors, there are eight total combinations that it could be. That's two to the third power, right? And so when you look at solving the recurrent neural network dynamics for x dot of t equals zero, and you plot it in low dimensional space, what you will find is eight stable attractors. Those are given by these black Xs corresponding to the eight distinct um, configurations of the output that it has to remember. And then there are also some of these unstable attractors shown here in green that mediate the transition between stable attractors. But what you can see here is that the recurrent neural network will essentially know what output to produce by transitioning between one of these eight points corresponding to the eight potential outputs it has. Any questions here? All right, so um, there's also, uh, because we have x dot of t, which are those velocity vectors uh, in the neural state space, or in this case, in the artificial neural network state space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The question is, uh, what are the eight potential outputs? Uh, so each line can be plus one or minus one. And so the outputs would be red plus one, green plus one, blue plus one. Then there's a red plus one, green plus one, blue minus one. And if you enumerate all of these, there will be eight unique combinations. Yeah, this is just an example for this particular task. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Uh, the question is, are these outcomes supervised? Do you mean when we train it, do we, yes, they're supervised. So we train it with supervised learning where we give a, a sequence of inputs and we tell it what the correct outputs should be. Exactly, yeah. Any other questions? All right, and I noticed that I'm doing a really bad job on time, Severa, so. Okay, uh, I might only be able to do the first example unless, unless we'll see, yeah. So just let me know when we need to finish. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so because x dot is the velocity vector that tells you for a given x of t, which direction I'm gonna go in next, you can actually project x dot of t into a plane and even visualize the dynamics. Though one should be really careful in doing this because depending on where the plane is, the dynamics could look wildly different. But that said, what you can do is you could take a recurrent neural network and actually extract out the flow fields that govern the trajectory. Right. So with this in mind, uh, the ability to calculate fixed points and study the dynamics, Monte and Cicillo did this analysis on their networks and what they identified was a line attractor. A line attractor is exactly as it sounds. I mentioned those attractor fixed points, and a line attractor is just a line of them. And so here on this red line here, you can imagine that there are just a bunch of stable fixed points here that form a line. And what they then did is, because we also have control over the inputs to the RNN, we can start to play experiments with the RNN and see how the dynamics work out. So Let's say that the RNN was told that it's in the motion context to pay attention to motion. What you could do is you could pulse in a bit of motion information that the dots were going to go towards choice one to the right, let's say. And when they pulsed in motion information and then turned off the inputs, they then looked to see what happened to the RNN state. And in the motion context, when they turned off the input pulse, it then relaxed and converged back to this line of track. So it should go back to the line attractor. That's a stable point that the RNN wants to be at. But the interesting thing is that uh, it made progress along the line attractor. Whereas in the motion context, if you give a pulse of color information, it decays back to the line attractor, but it goes towards the left. And again, progress on this line attractor will be towards choice one or towards a choice because the line attractor is heavily aligned with the, with the choice axis. And so in this case, a motion pulse led to progress towards the choice, whereas a color pulse was attenuated back to where we started. This led them to this mechanism. So what happens is along a line attractor, because it's a point of zero dynamics, 
the dynamic flow field around the line attractor can look very different. In fact, above the line attractor, you could have arrows that point down into the right, and then below the line attractor, you can have arrows that point up into the left. So in the motion context, what the arrows along this line attractor look like are, uh, are as shown. And now if you give a motion pulse, what that does is it pushes you off the line attractor into this flow field. And because the dynamics push you down into the right up here, then you're going to make progress along the line attractor, like shown here. When you give a color input, that input comes below the line attractor. And so when you get a color input, when you turn off the input, the dynamics are going to push you back to where you started. And so in this way, when you get motion evidence, it will be integrated along the line attractor towards the eventual choice. But when you get color inputs, they won't be integrated. They'll be uh, ignored because the dynamics push color evidence back to the initial starting point. Chris, yeah. If you were to like, give an interesting new value from select conductor and say, like, there are about half people in half, like, the question is, if you were to make the inputs halved, how much would we expect the flow field to change? Uh, or oh, this instead of saying like care about color or care about motion, but care about both equally. Yeah. So um, the flow field is defined by the actual recurrent neural networks parameters. That equation negative tau x dot equals minus, uh, sorry, tau x dot equals minus x plus dot, dot, dot. So um, the flow field will be, um, is something that's just there. But if you were to give um, a weaker amount of evidence, it would push you into a different plane where the dynamics could be different. Uh, so while the dynamic are set by the parameters of the network, a weaker input would push you potentially to like a, uh, a, an area where maybe the arrows are a bit weaker as well. Did that answer the question? Uh, or? I can do the Okay. Great. Yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, let me know if I'm answering the question correctly. The question is, uh, could I explain again how, um, based off of the context, it integrates one and not the other? To explain that mechanism again? Yeah, so um, in the motion context, let me put up the color context too. As opposed to the color context, the way that we should think of these is the motion context and the color context instantiate different dynamics. And so in this illustration, in the motion context, for the line attractor, the dynamics are pointing down into the right above it and up into the left below it. Whereas in the color context, they point down into the left above it and up into the right below it. So depending on which context you're in, motion and color inputs are going to go into different flow fields. And if you get a motion input in the top flow field, then when you turn off the input, it's going to relax back to this line attractor. And because the arrows point down to the right, you're going to actually make progress along the line attractor. Whereas if you get a color input, because this is in the direction opposing the flow field, uh, when you turn off the color input, that is not integrated. It's going to push the neural, the RNN state back to the origin. And so, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, the question is, in this framework, do they only have two types of input, motion and color? So there are four total inputs, uh, motion and color, evidence or coherence are two of the inputs. And then the other two inputs are, the first input is, am I in the motion context? And the other input is, am I in the color context? So those contextual inputs are what set the dynamics. And then the actual coherence inputs are what push you along this flow field. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions there? Any other questions? Yeah, Jiwen. Uh, the question is, are the field dynamics always perpendicular to the selection vector? Um, I believe they define the selection vector to be orthogonal to the dynamics at which you decay. Yes, so the answer is yes, I believe. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Yeah, the question is, uh, why does the network implement the line attractor? Uh, could it just be two stable fixed points? So there actually are two stable fixed points uh, at these locations. And uh, here's another detail that I'll talk about in the methods lecture. Uh, this line attractor actually isn't a location where x dot of t equals zero in the paper. They, they call it a line attractor. But actually, uh, the line attractor corresponds to when x dot of t is less than some threshold. So it's an area of slow dynamics. That threshold they set to one. And so you can think of this as this line attractor as uh, essentially like a, a, um, uh, like a, a shallow valley over which you can traverse to get to your stable attractor fixed point. Chasen? Yes, yeah, so uh, Chetan's bringing up that the line attractor can be stable. These points can be equal to zero. For, if I'm understanding correctly, you're making the distinction that for David's network, they called it a line attractor, uh, uh, and it's actually just like a, a, an attractor. It's still an attractor because the state goes there, but it's actually like a slow point. Great. So, yeah. So Chetan's asking uh, uh, the reason there's a line attractor is essentially so that there's stability along the way. I.e., if I did give motion pulses, um, I want to remember that I got motion evidence and that it led me towards this choice. And so, five seconds from now, I want to still be somewhere in progress towards the correct choice. And the line attractor being a region of slow dynamics, we'll recall that. We'll remember that. Um, actually, Brandon has done a, a further study on this. Uh, so first off, this is a new mechanism for integration. Um, let me actually really quickly show this slide from Brandon, which I won't go into much detail about. But there is actually like a, there's a way to stably integrate versus um, integrate uh, transiently. And so if you turn on a pulse of inputs, you're always going to decay back slowly to the origin because there's a line attractor there. But actually, for some network settings, you can instantiate additional fixed points that actually remember your state uh, when the input's turned off, as opposed to just decaying slowly along the line attractor. OK, any other questions here? All right. Um, so let me just talk about two more things because I'm definitely over time at this point. Uh, so you might have a question, which is uh, with neural networks, you can have all sorts of different architectures. Uh, you can have nonlinearities that are different. You can have learning rules that are different. How similar are these neural networks across these variations? So for architectures, if we're looking at the similarity of the representations, how similar do the artificial neurons look? When you choose different architectures, so we've been talking about a vanilla recurrent neural network, but there are also things like LSTMs, GRUs, Chapin probably talked about with LFADs, um, as well as nonlinearity, what that F is, if it's a rectified linear unit, ReLU, or the hyperbolic tangent, the representations will be quite different. Even if you use different learning rules, you may see some variation in the representations here, a lot of them are overlapping, but the Hebbian-like learning rule is different. On the flip side, if you look at the similarity of the dynamics, what we find, or what others have found, is that across different architectures, the dynamical mechanisms are conserved. Across learning rule, uh, sorry, across um, the nonlinear activation, there may be some variation, so you can still see some clustering here. And then across learning rule, uh, they're also highly overlapping. And so this suggests that when training these recurrent neural networks, there's some individuality in the representations based off of some of these choices. But when you look at the dynamical mechanisms, there is something closer to universality there. All right. And then uh, just because of time, I'm going to skip all of these slides um, where 
I also want to show how uh, neural networks can be used for multi-area modeling, which um, we can talk about in the in the philosophy and general uh, and general questions part. So I just want to go to um, one last slide here, which are some non-exhaustive ways that both artificial neural networks and recurrent neural networks are used in other tasks. So here's just a highlight. Is, um, uh, there are many other studies here. Uh, since we have limited time, I'll just talk, for example, about this navigation study, which is one put out by DeepMind that I thought was particularly cool. So they trained agents to do path integration. And what they found is that uh, there was a way to train agents so that the artificial neural networks in their recurrent component, in the, oh, sorry, their, uh, their artificial neurons uh, had grid cell-like encodings. So they had grid, uh, grid cell-like codes. And then one thing I really liked about the study is that they then showed that this grid cell-like code actually improves performance in navigation tasks. So they trained AI agents to navigate more challenging environments. And when those AI agents employed a grid cell-like code, just like the hippocampus, then they were able to do the task better. Right? And so there are many other ways RNNs and ANs are applied to vision, uh, to working memory, to timing tasks, et cetera. So it's had widespread application. All right. So the take home points for this lecture are that artificial neural networks, though complex, are simpler than the brain. And because they're fully observed, um, they can be probed to hypothesize mechanisms for how the brain does computation, given that the RNNs are uh, matching the behaviors as well as the artificial, uh, as well as the uh, activity of the neurophysiology. And then they have wide applications in neuroscience to, to propose computational uh, mechanisms. Yeah. All right, we'll call that lecture one. Okay. Right, thanks.